Um, has everybody enjoyed this? Good. Good, good, good. I want you to know the questions are up and we're ready to go. So we're gonna have the panelists come out. Um, we have four tonight, so it should be great. Um, we have Frank Turek, Elisa Childers, Michael Jones, and David Wood. So come on out, everybody, and uh, let's, uh, let's get ready to rumble. Here they come. All right. Thank you guys for being here, seriously. <clears throat> Are we ready to rumble? Okay, we're gonna go through as many as I can go, as quick as I can go, and um, let's make it happen. And I think we have really good monitors for you to hear. We finally figured out how to make this work. It only Sit took down. us three days, but on the third day. <laughs> so, here we go. <laughs> so, my friend who is a Christian universalist hinges his whole ideology on the belief that any mention in Scripture, Old Testament or new, of hell, damnation, eternal torment has been interpreted incorrectly. He holds that the Jewish concept of hell is not what we teach today, and there's no Greek word for hell. Can you speak to this? Yeah, I can speak a little bit to it. Uh, we definitely see the concept in the New Testament with the parable of the rich man and Lazarus being uh, Jesus also says in Matthew 16, I will give you the keys to Hades. So we do see this concept of this otherworldly place that is where the damned would go uh, and suffer there. So there's the debate. I mean, you'll see some annihilation to say it's temporary. You'll see eternal conscious torment. guys say it's eternal. That's not important. There definitely is that concept in the New Testament. So you do see it as part of scripture. And I think it'd be hard to deny that you see it clearly in the New Testament teachings. Anybody else? Good. Okay. I was just going to recommend a resource on this. Is Michael McClyman's about 2,000-page commentary called The Devil's Redemption, A New History of Universalism. And he traces universalism all the way back to the Gnostics and Kabbalists. It's a very interesting read. And I would just say also, just from a general perspective, it's, it, of course, we are, uh, we are scripture people, right? That's the final authority. But there also needs to be, I think, uh, a respect for how the church has interpreted these verses throughout church history for 2,000 years, and even just if you read past through uh, creeds that uh, different denominations even use, uh, universalism has never been a universally accepted position of the church. So I think that needs to at least come into the conversation when we're thinking about these things. It, there's also a concept in the Old Testament, it's called Sheol. I mean, Jonas says he goes down to Sheol, the roots of the mountains, the bar is closed on him forever. Uh, Jacob says, when jo he thinks Joseph is dead, shall I go down to Sheol mourning? I mean, there's a concept there. So to say that there's no concept, I think it's just overreaching. And it doesn't, isn't this guy ignoring the teachings of Jesus who talked about hell more than heaven? I mean, what would be, I don't know what the questioner is saying here, but it would, it would appear that Jesus talks about hell quite a bit. Oh, so yeah. why is he talking about hell if everyone's going to heaven? Yeah. And, I, and I, I don't know that that's, when they say there's, there's Hades, Gehenna, Tartarus are three Greek words that are used in, in that reference, not that we're trying to go Greek on everybody, but I mean, I, 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 that, it's strange to say that there's not, you might could argue that maybe the words should be translated like Hades, abode of the dead, or Gehenna, which was obviously where, you know, you had the Valley of Hanom. But I, 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 the idea here is Jesus is saying that there's hell. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't I'm not quite sure what. What's the name of the book that you you helped co-write that's coming? Well, out it's. It, I think I think it's called Rethinking Hell, and it's it's. I think there's two views. It's annihilationism and eternal conscious torment. It's an IVP academic book. Should be out soon, um, and uh, you know th th that'll probably be the resource for most seminarians for the next 10 to 15 years. At least that's what IVP's hope is. So you should really be able to get a good perspective. Um, on hell, uh, you know, when that comes out. Um, I remember when they wrote me, they said, Dr. Bennett, would you um, be a contributing author? They didn't like my response. I, I like to have fun. You know, I mean, it, Christians can have fun, right? You know, my response was, sounds like a hell of a time, um, but they didn't like it. So uh, <clears throat> anyway, that was what it was, uh, but I still won. So anyway, but uh, let's see, what is the best evidence that you cannot lose salvation? 
Jesus saying he who believes has passed from death into life. And in that sense, he's saying you get eternal life when you believe, not when you die. And if it's eternal, can you lose it? Wouldn't seem so. Does, it, does, any, does it, is anybody on the, and it's okay, does anybody believe that you can lose your salvation on the panel? David lost it earlier today. He's going to lose it again. That's, I'm agnostic on the whole situation. Okay. I, I have not decided on where I am on that. On that fair. Thing. That's fair. Okay. Um, why don't the Jews do live sacrifices anymore, and when did they stop doing them? When they lost the temple. The end. Yeah. They, they don't have a temple. They can't. <clears throat> and if you ask why they don't do sacrifices, because in the law itself, there's only one place where sacrifices can happen, and they can't do them there. So, um, this is great. Hey, Frank, are we still down for dinner? Yeah, meet me at Waffle House. If, if I don't show up, wait longer. <clears throat> when are all the speakers moving to Sarasota so that we can do this every week? Yeah, it's good. What an amazing conference. I am very blessed to have been part of this we will do this again next year, guaranteed, okay? And we will, we will try to get the monitors out earlier this time rather than the third day. So, uh, but yeah, thanks. I'm glad that you all have uh, enjoyed this. It's great. Um, and you all, anybody wants to move to Sarasota? It's a beautiful town. It's a great place. Um, how do we answer people who say that Jesus and or events of his life were made up to say they fulfill Old Testament prophecies? So just to understand the question, are they saying that uh, some of the events were just sort of made up to fulfill Old Testament prophecies? That's what it sounds like. It sounds like um, people who, how do we answer people who say that Jesus and or the events of his life were made up? So they made up some of Jesus' stories. They made up his events to say that they fulfilled Old Testament prophecies. Yeah, we start to argue for the reliability of the gospels and the evidence for the resurrection. I mean, if Jesus really did rise from the dead, it gives us good reason to trust what he said. If we can argue for the reliability of the Gospels, that gives us good reason that we're really reading reliable traditions, and they're not just reading the Old Testament. Also, Robert Price made this kind of argument, I believe, in the book Five Views of Jesus, and he was like, well, Mark is grabbing from this place, and then he's grabbing from that place, and he's grabbing from that place, and you go, this is a mess. Like Mark is grabbing from the Psalms, the Odyssey, then Jonah, then Micah, then the Exodus. It's like, there's no real pattern there if they're just making all this up. So if he's taking that approach, it's just a wild random grab all from the Old Testament. There's no pattern or rhythm there. It seems more likely that they would see Jesus do things and they'd be like, well, that reminds me of what Moses did. Let me write this in a similar way. That's what Elijah did. Let me write this in a similar way. That's the actual pattern. And then you draw connections to the Old Testament. I mean, I did a video on that a while ago. Did, did the New Testament, like, you know, misquote the Old Testament on that kind of stuff. And yeah, it's, it's nonsense. It doesn't really follow. Uh, I, I would just say prove it, right? In, in other words, there's a, there's a difference between someone saying... Uh, oh, look, this passage says that Jesus fulfilled this prophecy and I'm skeptical and you can't use that as proof with me because I think that may have been invented later. There's a difference between being skeptical and just claiming that it, that it was made up, that the story was made up to fulfill a prophecy. Uh, I would say if you're, if you're skeptical, I, I, I get that, and so we'd, we'd, look at, uh, we, we'd look at the evidence, but if you're actually claiming, no, this was made up, okay, you, you're the one who made the claim, now defend it. Like, how, how, do you, how do you show that this couldn't be a fulfilled prophecy and someone made it up? And I'd, I'd be interested in seeing what, what your evidence is. I think also what we need to remind people is that the New Testament documents were written down by Jews, with the exception of Luke. He's the only Gentile. And Jews thought they were God's chosen people. And a couple of things they didn't think would happen. They didn't think that one guy would rise from the dead in the middle of time and they didn't think that someone could claim to be God. That would be blasphemy. So for them to say one guy did rise from the dead in the middle of time and he actually claimed to be God. And then they endured persecution, suffering and death for saying that it would seem that would not be a motivation to make this up. 
Why make up a religion that, that's, first of all, you already think you're God's chosen people. Why are you going to make up a new religion that gets, your, that gets you and your colleagues beaten, tortured, and killed? You're not. In fact, we, we like to put it this way, that the New Testament writers did not create the resurrection. The resurrection created the New Testament writers. You wouldn't have documents written in the first century by Jews claiming a man claimed to be God and rose from the dead unless a man really did claim to be God and rose from the dead because the motivation to do this isn't there. In fact, they had every motive to say it didn't happen, not every motive to say it did. You know, our friend Jay Warner Wallace, the cold case homicide detective, says, if you're going to say that the New Testament writers invented this, you have to prove one or more of these three motivators. There was either a sex issue, a money issue, or a power issue. That's why people will invent stuff. That's why people will sin for sex, money, and power. So just think about the New Testament writers. Did they get real popular with the ladies for saying Jesus had risen from the dead? No. Did they get money? No, they weren't 21st century prosperity gospel preachers. Did they get power? No, they got the opposite, persecution. There's no motive to make it up. Every motive to say it wasn't true, but they said it was and went to their deaths anyway. Well, and here's a question to ask. Yes, that was great. I didn't mean to interrupt your no, applause. No, no, go, go, go. Please finish your applause for Dr. Turek. That was very good. Here's a question also, and I'll just say this very quickly, but some people might even say, well, they made up the story because they thought he was going to rise from the dead and he didn't, so they kind of had to redeem the story in some way. Uh, Craig Evans has written a bit on this, and Jeremiah Johnson's written a bit on this. We know that there were other people who claimed to be the Jewish Messiah who died, and then the way the Jews responded to them was not to try to redeem their story, but actually call them liars, and actually uh, the Jews responded with great vitriol and anger at these people who had made these claims, and then it was false. So why? The question is, why would they... If Jesus didn't really raise from the dead and they're just making it up, why would they do that when in every other case, they actually call the guy a liar? So that's another question to ask about why they would make something up. And you probably wouldn't have had the first witnesses of the resurrection to preach be women. In Exodus 21, 22 through 25, the Bible clearly states that a fetus is worth less than the mother. If a man accidentally causes a woman to miscarry, he must pay a fine. However, if he kills the woman, he's to be put to death. Numbers 5, 11 through 31, God gives instruction on how to perform abortions on unfaithful women. Why then is abortion hated by modern Christians other than political reasons? The second passage was Numbers. Numbers 5, okay. 11 through 31. So I've done a lot of TikTok videos on this. Numbers 5 is not about abortion. It's not. The woman is brought in and it says if she is found innocent, then she will conceive. It's not about abortion. And ra later rabbis even had a conversation if a woman who was pregnant should even be brought into this ordeal. So that passage is not about abortion and scholars are pretty clear. It's about a woman who is uh, thought of as committing adultery, but they, not that she is actually conceived. So that's to keep in mind. With the other passage, I mean, one thing we need to keep in mind with the Mosaic Law is this is not what we think it is. A lot of biblical scholars have written about this, like Dilbert Hillers, John Walton as well. This is not some sort of perfect moral law for all times and all people. This is culturally situated wisdom for a stiff-necked people in their time. Remember what Jesus said. You were given a law of divorce because your hearts were hard. What did Samuel say in 1 Samuel 8? You, kings are a bad idea, but God is willing to modify his covenant with you to include a king. But it's a bad idea, but he'll take your input in and whatever. Not everything God is doing in there is giving them a perfect moral law. He's giving them culturally situated wisdom to get them to a point where they can eventually get the new covenant, which would be for all people uh, from there to come. So keep that in mind. God is working with stiff-necked people. He's working in a culture. This is not going to be... Uh, universal moral laws, and the Bible even admits that in places like I mentioned. The other thing to keep in mind is we keep wanting to read the Torah as if this is a legal law code, and that's just not the way the ancient Near East looked at these things. They were not law codes. They were more like treatises on judicial wisdom. This is what justice would look like in an ideal setting. No one looked at the Code of Hammurabi as if that was the law for the rules in, the, in Hammurabi's kingdom. This was him displaying his judicial wisdom to the people, but they didn't consult that for court cases. 
Likewise, it's the same thing with the Torah. This was a treatise on judicial wisdom to teach them what justice could look like in ideal settings, not something that they were applying in practical means. So I have a video called The Misunderstood Mosaic Law where I go into details and I give quotes from experts. As an agnostic, what would be the greatest argument to convert to Christianity instead of maintaining a neutral mindset towards it? Retirement plan's pretty good. <laughs> I mean... It, I mean, if you're neutral... I mean, it would depend on the agnostic. Uh, I mean, like show him the evidence, show him the good aspects of it. And once you show him the evidence, if he's still on the fence, then I think you can employ something like Pascal's wager. So I don't think you can employ Pascal's wager apart from already giving other arguments, but you get enough arguments to an agnostic and they go, yeah, I guess it's kind of convincing, but I'm not sure if I'm there. Okay, then employ Pascal's wager. Infinite reward if you're right. If you're wrong, okay, inf infinite, infinite bad stuff. Uh, but, it, it, you know, but if agnosticism is right or Christianity is wrong, okay, well, then it doesn't matter. So I think Pasco wager on top of the evidence is a good way to go. I would ask them why they're an agnostic. What evidence would they need to see to tip them either way and see what they say? So, okay. Uh, and I would ask them, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? If they hesitate or say no, they're not an agnostic. They don't want it to be true. Do young children go to heaven? I, you after, know, after two, maybe. <laughs> after the terrible twos, maybe. Go ahead. Uh, so I assume the question m means do they go to heaven when they die, if they die at a certain age when they're young? Yeah, that, they don't put a, a time stamp on it, but just yeah. do young children go to heaven? I'm guessing that's... It's my belief that they do. <clears throat> I think there's a good biblical case that can be made for that. I think even looking back into the law, they weren't held accountable to the law till a certain age. Now, does that mean there's like the age of accountability as people talk about? I don't know. I think that might differ for each kid about their uh, ability to understand uh, the gospel and their own sinfulness. Uh, but yeah, it's my view that they do. And there are a lot of theologians that make a good case for this. So I think uh, John MacArthur is one. He's got a book about this and, and many others. Yeah, there's some scriptural support you can give. So Romans 5.13 says, sin is not counted where there is no law. As Alicia was saying, if they're not expected to be able to understand the law, then sin is not counted. Uh, John 9.41 and John 15.22, Jesus said, talking about the Pharisees, if I had not come, they would not be guilty. Now that I have come, they've got no excuse. Okay, that implies that if young children have not been made of their sin they're not held accountable for it because they've not been made aware of why they are guilty so i think there's some scriptural support uh, from implication there and then david tells his assistant after he stops mourning when his son dies he says i will go to him he will not come to me implying that he's going to see his son again in the afterlife michael made a comment about hunting in heaven. I'd like everyone's so, opinion of what heaven will look like. Let me uh, give the context here. So I was just speculating about my view of the eschaton and not heaven, the resurrection when we come back to earth. And this is something I'd actually talked with my pastor about as we were talking about this, like what is, you know, humans are just naturally, we are competitive type people. Uh, that's just the way God has made us. And in the eschaton, we're not going to be with wars, but we were saying there'll probably be games. There might be hunts as well, because uh, we don't believe we're going to be vegans in the eschaton. There will still, just like Jesus ate fish, there could still be fishing and hunting. So not talking about heaven, I'm saying in the resurrection to come, there could very well be uh, hunting or fishing and games and these types of things. And again, I was speculating. I'm not saying that that's a fact that's going to happen. Favorite Christian books, authors. Lisa, Elisa Childers. <laughs> I mean, I, I was going to say that, but <laughs> <laughs> I saved you. Yeah, no, I would say for me, uh, there's so many. I mean, how do you how do you pick? I mean, apologetics. Uh, you you can go to C.S. Lewis. 
Uh, Lee Strobel writes a great book because he interviews the best scholars out there. Um, you can look at anything by John Lennox. You can look at Tim Keller's book, Reason for God is very good. Um, I'm sure there's some older ones I'm just not thinking of right now. Well, just some off the top of my head. Uh, Augustine's Confessions is one of my favorites. I think every Christian should read that, uh, you know, the Bible, and then read Augustine's Confessions. I don't agree with everything in it, but it's, it's just a tremendous book. I love that. Um, I like old dead guys, so G.K. Chesterton, C.S. Lewis, um, some of the uh, Puritan writers, J.C. Ryle, some of those guys are, are great to read. And I just really like reading some of the early church fathers. It, it, it really, I find a lot of comfort in reading Justin Martyr and uh, some of these people that were dealing with similar things that we are, to totally different contexts, of course. But you can trace it through and really see the same Holy Spirit and the same Word of God in what they're saying. And of course, fallible, they got things wrong, of course, and some things really wrong. But it, it's, it's, to me, comforting to read uh, those guys. So uh, that would be some of the ones. Oh, and, and Carl Truman. Anything Carl Truman writes uh, is really amazingly wonderful and helpful to the body of Christ, I think. On uh, Old Testament reliability, Kenneth Kitchen on the reliability of the Old Testament is good. Uh, John Berg has got a great book called Murmuring Against Moses. Uh, Joshua Berman, he's a Jew, though. His book is um, Inconsistencies in the Torah. Another good book where each chapter is a different author is Did I Not Bring Israel Out of Egypt? On Reliability of the Old Testament. Uh, for New Testament, at the top of my head, uh, Christobiography by Craig Keener is going to be great. Uh, Reinventing Jesus by Daryl Bach is good. Dethroning Jesus by Craig Evans. Or no, that's Dethroning Jesus by Daryl Bach and Dan Wallace. Craig Evans has a book called Fabricating Jesus. Uh, and then Michael Cohn has got a great, great book called Why There Are Differences in the Gospels. Uh, what Are the Gospels by Richard Burridge is a good book as well. So that's on Old Testament and New Testament reliability. Just some things I can think of. Gary Habermas's new magnum opus. Yeah, I've not read that yet. Historical Evidences. It's 1,100 pages. Bathroom reading. <laughs> I am sitting beside the biggest nerd on the entire planet. I thought Mike Winger. I thought Mike Winger was. Anyway. Oh, anyway. You're just jealous of my swag. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I go in a different direction. Uh, C.S. Lewis, Till We Have Faces, um, which is interesting because you read the book, it's all like pagan stuff. But uh, I don't know. I kind of I kind of like that where it has a, a subtler uh, message that you have to think about. Uh, G.K. Chesterton, Orthodoxy. Um, I can think of a couple Francis Schaeffer books, but uh, yeah, along those lines. Whatever, nerd. <laughs> Michael made a comment about universalism. Can he clarify his position? Depends on what I said. Like, I think that it's possible for, I think I said like, it's possible for a Christian to be universalist and orthodox. Like, um, I have some friends that are universalist and they, they believe in a hell. They just think it'll eventually be emptied. They think that hell is not eternal. Everyone will eventually be gotten out of it. So I said, I guess there is a way you could fit into orthodoxy at the end of the day. So I think uh, I, don't, I don't consider that necessarily a non-orthodox belief is all I was saying. They're only saying that because they live in Tucson. No, they, they actually wanna, live in California. They want to get out of the heat, yeah. One I can think of is David Bentley Hart is the guy that I'm thinking of, I know of. Yeah, now I just wanted to point out, you. Um, so you, you have kind of like a village universalism, which is, uh, well, I don't want anyone to, so I, I hope everyone goes to heaven, and so I believe that's what God's going to do. You do actually have like philosophical defenses of it that, uh, would appeal to certain like Bible verses like uh, God wants everyone to be saved and they would say well if God wants everyone to be saved He's gonna find a way even if it doesn't even if it doesn't fit. keep in mind. I'm not I'm not defending that it does not sound like that is what's what scripture is saying um, But the point is there are there are people who who like have serious perspectives uh, On this so it doesn't have to just be some Some weird thing. So the question is whether the right doesn't sound like they are but I still, I still think that's a position that's outside of Christian orthodoxy. I know I said that the other night, and I'll just reiterate, reiterate that. Um, there's no creed or universally accepted position of that in church history, and I think it's outside of orthodoxy. That's my opinion. Appreciate that. Um, how would you refute the Marian, and I'm guessing this is the Virgin Mary, apparitions that are reported to be happening around the world? I was in Medjugorje in 1998 
because my uncle is Catholic and he took a whole bunch of us there. And one of the visionaries, I don't know if you know about Medjugorje, but they say that the Blessed Mother has appeared to people there. And this one woman we had an opportunity to meet, she was one of the visionaries. And um, they, she didn't want any questions, but I was able to ask her one question. And I said, did the Blessed Mother tell you to read such and such a book? I can't remember the book now. And she said, oh yes, the Blessed Mother did. I said, okay, thank you. Well, the book that was told, that this supposed apparition told her to read was condemned by the Catholic Church as heresy. Not every apparition comes from the good side. So that was only my experience on it. Mm -hmm. That's all I know about it. Um, but it was just odd because I said to my uncle, she just said to read a book the Catholic Church mm -hmm. said you shouldn't read. Okay. Scholars seem to differ on when Revelation was written before or after 70 AD, what do you believe and why? My friend Chip Bennett believes pre Every single book in the New Testament I'm was written before that. 70 AD. Uh, yeah. There's yeah, no I, reason not to believe that. John yeah. 5, John, they date John late oh, because they want to take away from the Christological, they want to make it a Christological development. Um, John 5, it says there is in Jerusalem, it's a present tense, there is in Jerusalem the colonnades. They would not have been there after 70 AD. We're buying into, in my opinion, even the evangelical scholars are buying into some of the, the, the critical theories of dating, and I think there's no reason. The book of Mark, which is usually considered to be the earliest gospel, it says specifically, the high priest says to Jesus, are you the Christ, the son of the living God? He says, I am, and from now on you will see me coming in the clouds, and the high priest rent his robe. He's quoting Daniel 7. That is a high Christological passage in an early gospel. I don't think you need to fall for the fact that these things had to be taken time, 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 time to develop that Jesus was deity. The early church believed Jesus was God. We don't need 40 or 50 years to figure that out. They knew it from the day that they saw him risen from the dead. I'll just add Kenneth Gentry. What's that? Kenneth Gentry's got a good book on dating Revelation to around 70 AD. So. Yeah, there's a new book by um, Bernier. There's only two books. There's only two scholarly books that have been written in 100 years. Only two. J.A.T. Robinson and Jonathan Bernier. Both scholarly books date every single book before 70 AD. So, so it's like the critical theory people and, or critical liberal scholars, it's like write a book, c contest it. You know, um, I see no reason to Well, actually, Bishop Robinson was a liberal. He, he was, I he know. He even came I to know. the early conclusion. Go ahead, David, you had some. What? I was going to say something. Oh, yeah, yeah, I was just going to put, I've never understood the, uh, the idea that, uh, that having a high Christology means you're late. I mean, yeah. everyone grants at least some of the letters of Paul, and he has an extremely high yeah. Christology, and he's very early. And then he's quoting, I mean, he's quoting like, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in Philippians 2, he's, he's quoting uh, a hymn, and so Christians are actually singing about this, and so... And that, that's, that's very early stuff. So the idea that it has to be later is just insane. It's, it's just, when you read the New Testament, the fact that the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, that nobody's going. Book of Hebrews, chapter 10, the priests stand daily offering sacrifices in the temple. Why wouldn't you say, if you're the writer of the Hebrews who's saying Jesus is greater than everything, why wouldn't you go, and by the way, it's gone and the only sacrifice is Jesus. You wouldn't do that unless you're writing before 70 AD, Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, all are Jesus talking about the destruction of the temple. It, it, the writers would have said, and he was right. Or it, it, I, I, have a, I have an issue with trying to, because then, then prophecy becomes retrofitted back in if Matthew's written in 80 AD. And I just, uh, but I mean, again, this is not a, ain't gonna be, not going to heaven or hell on it, but I think it was written before 70 AD. Chip, no, Gary Habermas, the scholar that just put out the first of four 1100 page volumes on the resurrection uh, says that the consensus among most scholars is that the earliest Christology is the highest Christology. Mm -hmm. 
from the very beginning. I mean, David was just mentioning him. There's, there's creeds throughout the New Testament yep. that point out that they were worshiping Yahweh. They were worshiping Jesus as, as God very, very early. Yep, I agree. Um, what is your understanding of the word predestined in the New Testament? We needed to bring vocab back up here because he's reformed, so he could have done better, probably. Depends on the context. Yeah, I know. Just, you want to take a stab at it? I'm guessing they're asking, does, what does it mean soteriologically? I'm guessing. That. Mine is, is that the better way to look at that word is guaranteed. So when Ephesians 1 says, all those who are in Christ are predestined, it's saying that anyone who's accepted Christ is guaranteed to be sealed with the Holy Spirit and ultimately, according to Romans 8, to be glorified. It doesn't mean you don't have a choice. You, if you're in Christ, you've made a choice. And now, since God is God, he's going to guarantee that you're going to wind up in heaven glorified. If people before Jesus were saved by believing in God, then why wouldn't the Pharisees and modern Jews be saved as they also believe in the same God? Well, I, I answered that earlier when I quoted John 9, 41 and John 15, 22. Jesus said, if I had not come, they'd have no excuse. Now that I've come, they have no excuse. So he says, look, they've now been given new updated information about the Messiah and who God is, and they're rejecting it. So now their guilt remains, is what he says. So Jesus is clear that you have to believe in him now that he has come, and that he has descended from heaven, as he says in John 3. And so that changes the game now, according to God himself. Who are the Nephilim? Nephilim. How much time do in, we have? In, can't, you can't escape Genesis 6 and any Q&A, dude. Um, and why are they mentioned both before the flood and after the flood? Weren't Noah and his family the only ones alive after the flood? Anyone want to go before me? I, all right. So I've answered this every day of this year. So, so there's Michael Heiser's view, which is, tends to be the main view today, is that the uh, Nephilim are descendants from angels that mated with women in Genesis 6, 1 to 4. I'll be honest, I don't take that view. I don't think that's what's happening, and here's why. It says, when the sons of God saw the daughters of men were beautiful, they went into them, and they took as many as for their wives, something like that. The very next verse is verse 3. It says, God said, my spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. So God is only mad at men. That implies the two groups that were just talked about are groups of men. It says the Nephilim are mighty men, men of renown. Okay, it says they're men. Then the flood comes. Why is God sending the flood? Not because of angels, the sin of humans. It says very clearly this is all about human sin. This is why. In Genesis 3, the serpent is punished, and I say that's a divine being. So you see the sin of the serpent, and you see him have a divine punishment. There is no punishment for any divine beings in Genesis 6 or 7. It's just about the sin of humans. That implies that what we're seeing here is humans acting on their own, doing bad things. The view I take is put out by Alan Millard, Meredith Klein, Old Testament scholars, and what they argue is that the sons of God is a term for an ancient king in that culture. Uh, Elsewhere in the Bible, yeah, the phrase is used for divine beings, but in this context, it's being used for king. They say that it's talking about kings becoming polygamous. How does the story end in Genesis 4? Lamech becomes polygamous. The story picks up, according to Klein and Millard, saying, well, now even these kings, these rulers, are now even, they're also becoming polygamous. And there's also men, they only care about their names. And there's violence over the earth. Look at all the sin. Polygamy, violence, all this stuff is happening. Flood comes. So I'd say this is just about, uh, and look at how Noah is talked about. We keep being told Noah had one wife and his sons only had one wife. He was righteous. So the righteous person is monogamous versus the bad people that were not being monogamous, that kind of thing. Now, why are the Nephilim mentioned in Numbers 13, 33 after the flood? They're not. Well, they are mentioned, but they weren't there. Remember, that is coming in a report from the 10 bad spies of Israel. The text even says, now the 10 spies bought a bad report. It says it's a bad report. And they say there were Nephilim in the land. We get to the report in Deuteronomy, it doesn't mention the Nephilim. So it seems like the 10 spies were trying to f create fear among the Israelites so they wouldn't go in. And so they just said, we saw Nephilim. Uh, but Joshua and Caleb don't confirm the report. The report in Deuteronomy doesn't confirm Nephilim in the land. They weren't there. So 
Yeah, the Nephilim were just mighty men, men of old. It refers to those who have fallen, maybe fallen in battle or fallen in sin. And I think they were just humans. But I mean, you could take Heiser's view to give you his book for an alternative. Check out his book, The Unseen Realm, and you can get his view on that. But that's my view. Also, the book I mentioned yesterday, When Critics Ask, it's now called The Big Book of Bible Difficulties. That was written by Dr. Norman Geisler. And uh, when I go to that passage, he says there are several possible interpretations, and then he gives three or four of them. So you can avail yourself of that. How relevant is a scholarly consensus to a discussion? Shouldn't the evidence that convinces scholars be mentioned rather than the consensus? Yes. And as somebody who deals a lot in progressive Christianity, they would win that argument every time because most scholars are critical scholars now. They're very liberal. So if you just go with the most amount of people that agree on something, I mean, it certainly has weight, I think, because you have people who are educated in a particular discipline, and, and if they all come together and say this or that, I understand why that has weight, but I, I agree with Michael. It, it has to be the evidence. It has to be, and, and this is something our friend Jay Werner Wallace points out as well, is if you're not a scholar, I'm not a scholar, but if you're not a scholar like me, it's kind of like in a courtroom, you're the jury, we're the jury. The scholars are the experts. And in, in a trial, they bring in an expert and the jury is the one who makes the decision. And so that's our job is we can listen to the experts, but ultimately we evaluate what they're saying about the evidence and we look at the evidence and we come to a judgment, right? And so uh, in progressive Christianity, they would win the argument every time if they just said, well, scholarly consensus on, you know, was Jesus resurrected or something? Um, they probably, numbers wise, <laughs> can, can beat us because a lot of times seminaries, seminaries are very liberal and they're educating people in uh, theological liberalism and uh, the kind of the modern version of higher criticism. So um, yeah, I agree with Michael. I think that you have to look at the evidence and just remember, you don't have to be an expert. You're the jury. You get to listen to the experts and make your decision. Although one of the advantages of the so-called minimal effects approach to the resurrection is that Gary Habermas and Michael Kona and others have surveyed all this data of scholars and they say, well, here are six facts that even liberals agree with. And we could go into the evidence as to why they agree with it. You know, Jesus was crucified. He was seen by his disciples who thought he had risen from the dead. Paul was converted. James was converted. These are some of the facts, right? The issue isn't the facts, really. The issue is, how do you best interpret the facts? And so when Elisa says, you're the jury, what best explains these facts that virtually all scholars agree on? And what's really telling in today's day and age is Gary will point out, Gary Habermas is, you know, scholars used to give alternative theories to the resurrection, naturalistic theories, whether it's the swoon theory, and you, you've covered that, Mike, or... Mm -hmm. The, I had a debate on it. Yeah, yeah, you, just get, you had a debate on the swoon theory uh, and, uh, or the hallucination theory. None of those theories work, and they know it. So you know what they say now? Uh, we don't know what happened, which is telling you that the evidence is so strong pointing toward the resurrection, but they just don't want to say it. Well, and I would say, too, just to add to that, a scholarly consensus can certainly be used for certain purposes. Like, I, I love the minimal facts. I think that's really a powerful argument to be able to say to somebody, look, virtually every scholar agrees on certain facts, and then you talk about how to interpret those facts. That is actually a process I did when I was trying to figure out if I could trust the Bible, the transmission of the manuscripts for the New Testament. I, I just thought, okay, what are all, what, what's the most conservative guy saying, and what's the most liberal guy saying? Well, they all agree that there's four or 500,000 variants. There's about 500 or I'm sorry, 5,000 manuscripts. So, so what does this mean was the question, you know, between everybody agrees on these facts, they just disagree on how to interpret them. But I guess you could parse it out and say the scholarly consensus doesn't necessarily mean that, the, that it's actually true, right? You still have to make the judgment. Um, so I, I guess I would make that distinction. Yeah, I just wanted to, because uh, what you're originally saying was, you know, just because uh, more people favor this view, which is different from a, a consensus, right, right. Um, yeah, so if you, if you take something like, let's say, the, the crucifixion of Jesus, and it, it's not just like you're counting up the scholars, it's that there's a massive consensus, and it's just people from a wide range of different views, like, you, you know, conservative Christians, liberal Christians, atheists, agnostic scholars, Jewish scholars, and like across the board from every, you know, conceivable theological position, 
uh, agreeing on something where lots of people would have reasons to disagree wherever they could possibly disagree. Uh, I would take that seriously in terms of if someone comes along with and rejects it and just says, oh, I, I take this opposite position, I'd be like, okay, whatever, whatever is causing you to reject this, you, you, you've got to explain why you're seeing something that, uh, that everyone else is somehow missing. Like, you know, with, with Muslims denying the crucifixion of Jesus, I'm like, okay, we're, why would you take that seriously when every other perspective and every person who studies this comes to the, uh, the opposite conclusion and so on? So I, I think there's a role, but at the end of the day, even there, if you're talking to, to someone about that, you still have to, okay, why do all these scholars think this? Why does everyone who investigate this? Uh, it's, it, yeah, it would still come down to the evidence. So ideally, I, guess, I would guess it's, a, it's some sort of mixture if you're really trying to present a case. Yeah, you got a consensus, here's why. I think this is really telling because I had, did, had responded to this social media. Bart Ehrman on um, ehrmanblog.org has a blog on how do we know what most scholars think? So Bart Ehrman, if you're not aware, would not agree probably with much of the things we're saying up here. But it's interesting because somebody challenged him when he said the majority of scholars say this. A person wrote in and said, yeah, but there's also conservative evangelical scholars. How do you know what the weight is? And he has a very, very long deal, but here's what he says at the end. He says, so when I say that most critical scholars, keyword, hold one view or another, I'm referring to the views held by the research scholars who teach at the schools that teach critical theory. That doesn't mean to say that most scholars hold one view or the other, because it always depends. If you mean most scholars total, then you would also have to include fundamentalist and conservative evangelicals. And I frankly don't know the proportion of evangelical to non-evangelical scholars in the country. That's why I can't really say most scholars think X, Y, or Z, so what I try to say is, and I do make mistakes, but most critical scholars think. So the point is, is it's really difficult to say what the consensus of scholarship is. And I think he's right. You have to say critical scholars believe this. And I think that sometimes gets changed into consensus. And that's not necessarily true. So just a thought there. Um, I know y'all didn't come here to hear me talk, but I'm going to throw that in anyway. Um, let's continue here. Um, when we die, are we instantly with Jesus? Absent from the body, present with the Lord. How can we determine what documents to include in the Bible as Scripture? Why isn't St. Clement's letter to the Corinthians a candidate for Scripture, whereas the epistle to the Hebrews is? Yeah, it's a good question. The early church fathers did sort of disagree a little bit about this. Uh, like, should Clement be included? Should Hebrews be included? They all agreed, Paul's letters, four Gospels, Acts, and there was some debate about things like Revelation, Hebrew, James, uh, some of these books. And maybe we should include the Shepherd of Hermas, first letter of Clement, these kinds of things. Ultimately, what the early church decided is the canon of St. Athanasius the Great, uh, added, adamant defender of Trinitarianism. Uh, and the reason was, is from what I can gather from what church fathers said about this was, is that this was, this was appropriate and necessary to teach the Christian faith of what had come down from the apostles. Uh, we don't want to add too much uh, in later ideas that may not be necessary to teach the faith. We want to, the canon needs to be what is necessary to teach the Christian faith. And they decided on the canon of St. Athanasius the Great, which is what most church, most church fathers prior to that accepted the majority of the canon. And again, there was a little debate about should Second Peter be in there, should Revelation be in there, but I think it was just, this is what we see the apostles taught. It is uh, what teaches the Christian faith, and it was either these books in the canon were either written by an apostle or one who followed them. You could say that First Clement is a little too far divorced. Shepherd of Hermas is a little too far divorced. We can't get a chain back to an apostle or someone who followed him. So it might be just a little too further out there. Well, there's also, I think, this misconception. I hear this a lot, that there were just all these books, and everybody was just like, gosh, which ones should we pick? I mean, I don't know. There's so many options. It's really not the way it worked. And uh, New Testament scholar Michael Kruger points out that even the early church, they had categories for this. So they knew what, they had categories for accepted books. They had a category for books they knew were scripture. They had books, uh, categories for books that they thought were helpful but weren't necessarily considered scripture. And then they had categories of books that they knew were heretical. So it's not like there was just this smorgasbord 
smorgasbord of books to choose from, and they just kind of prayed and said, well, we hope we pick the right ones. As Michael pointed out, it was very, much more organic the way that worked. And the point I always like to make to people is that you kind of have this core canon that emerges really, really early, even within the New Testament itself with uh, with evidence, internal evidence of the church uh, viewing Paul's letters as scripture. And even there's a verse in, I think it's in Luke, you know this better than I do, Frank, but in, in Luke where it, it says, it calls scripture, um, or is it Peter that calls Luke's gospel scripture? I think that's what it is. So there's internal evidence that they were already viewing these books as uh, scripture. And the early church was aware of this. And so, um, the most important point though is that the core canon contains the gospel like we have the gospel even though there were debates maybe over periphery books none of those are going to change uh, any kind of core cardinal doctrine of christianity that we had in this core canon from very very early so that might i, I think that's a misconception that people often have yes yeah, second peter chapter three um peter says that the ignorant and unstable twist paul's writings as they do the other scriptures so he's equating, you know, when that people like to try to date Second Peter super, super late too because of that particular um, thing. Um, for David Wood, and I'm probably not gonna pronounce this right and get it right, so please forgive me. How can we use the Islamic concept of the eyes in Sunan Abi Dawood 203? I'm from Kentucky. Please give me some grace if that's just butchered. I know. Uh, does anyone know what that's referring to? <laughs> yes, I do. I'm... Boy. Uh, we were goofing off and we popularized a hadith. Um, hadith, so that's a collection of Muhammad's sayings and teachings and uh, Sunan Abu Dawood. It's one of their main collections, number 203. Muhammad said, the eyes are the leather strap of the anus. And we all thought that, because we couldn't figure out what that meant, right? <laughs> so I had to actually do a research project and go to their scholars to figure out what he's talking about. The eyes are the leather strap of the anus. And uh, so I, find, I finally figured it out. So uh, the, the leather strap was the leather strap on a, on a water bottle. Um, and so he put a strap around it to seal it. And what Muhammad was saying was that... Uh, when you're awake, your eyes are open and you have like conscious control out of over what comes out of you. <laughs> uh, whereas if you're asleep, your eyes are closed, then you don't know what's going to slip out. And so it was a way of telling people, hey, wash up when you get up, which I mean, he could have just said that. <laughs> but he puts it as the eyes of the leather strap of the anus and we just kind of popularized it to make fun of things. But what the, the real point is, Muhammad in the Hadith brags about his supernatural eloquence and way of explaining things. And I don't know, I just think that's like probably the worst way you could possibly say that. So anyway, it just became, now everyone says it because we, cause we, uh, we made a joke out of it. I really do think we need t-shirts though. Yeah. Oh, oh, they're, they're coming. <laughs> they're coming. Yeah, the eyes are the leather strap of the anus, Prophet Muhammad. I'm going to wear that, the Dome of the Rock, next time. Anyway. I just ask them. You know, um, wow, okay. What is a woman? <laughs> An adult human female. That really wasn't hard. It did not deserve applause, but thank you. Is a hot dog a sandwich? <laughs> if ketchup is a fruit, is a, <coughs> is, does Goodness that make ketchup gracious. a smoothie? Okay. Why was Adam afraid to be naked in the presence of God? What was so bad about him being naked? And how does this demonstrate his sinfulness? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know if we have a solid answer on this entirely, but I could have for some ideas I've heard in the scholarship. Um, I think I remember maybe it was Walton talking about this. It's when we mess up, we feel shame and we want to cover ourselves up physically often. Uh, not, you know, so it, when you're with God and you feel no shame, who cares the way you look at it? If, the idea is that when they partook of the tree, they gained knowledge and now they knew they had messed up and they could feel that shame. And so it's just natural to hide and want to hide your body. 
Uh, so I think that's just a psychological effect of just feeling the shame of your own sin. Thoughts on Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, they are seen frequently on college campuses. They won't come to my house anymore. <clears throat> that's where they've been. Well, I think you want to treat all people kindly, especially them when they come to your door and ask a bunch of questions and see why they believe what they believe. And um, actually, there's a, a gentleman that teaches a course for us, an online course, his name's Brady Blevins, he's with Watchman Fellowship. And he recommends if they do come to your door, you want to say, hey, this is really not a good time, but I'd love to talk to you guys. Can you guys come back next week in such and such a time? Because you want to be prepared. You want to have the questions ready to go and be able to ask the questions that can uncover what their beliefs are and maybe some faults in what they believe. Because when you woke up that morning, you were not thinking you were talking to a Mormon, a Jehovah's Witness, were you? But they were thinking they were going to talk to you. So you may want to say, hey, let's, let's do this next week and then get prepared. Why does David Wood hate Mike Winger so much when Mike's clearly cooler? <laughs> oh, look at him. Look at him. He's... Why do I not like Mike Winger? My goodness, where do I begin? <clears throat> his nerd face, his nerd videos, his nerd glasses, his nerd shirt, his nerd hair, sitting in front of his nerd books and his nerd bookshelves. And don't even get me started on his fans. Everyone else has like cool names for their like John McRae. He's, he's, uh, he's, uh, you know, his channel's What Do You Meme? So he calls his fans the meme team. What are Mike Winger's fans called? The Wingalings. What is that? It sounds like, it sounds like you're calling them Dingalings. Who's going to do that to his own fans? And it's, it's a, uh, you know, I don't know. It seems like something a psychopath would do. And so I'm just saying it would not surprise me at all if police investigate and find like severed heads in his freezer in his garage he's basically the worst person in the world and i'll leave it at that chip could next year could you get him and mike winger on stage to have a talk together i think it'd be great yeah, what was that again get, uh david and mike winger on stage together to have a powwow we could, we could we could we could do that next year that sounds like a hey good, i good just one. wanted to say something about the mormons yeah because i was just thinking like i've never i've never really studied cults except when i was actually like discussing with them, like, uh, like when I was actually discussing with the Jehovah's Witness or with Mormons who showed up and then I would get marked and they would never come back and so I would never study it again so I'd forget everything. But uh, just from personal observation, because we, we lived in the Bronx for like uh, 13 years, it seems like just in that time, Jehovah's Witnesses became less and less active. They didn't seem like, mm. I mean, they were shutting places down. They weren't showing up at, door, uh, showing up at people's doors anymore. They got to where... They were only like standing uh, in subway stations and they would just hand stuff out if you came mm. up to them to see what they were doing. So I don't know what's been going on there, but it seems like that was becoming less and less active. Don't know why. Whereas Mormons, that was a completely different story. Again, don't know why. But I was walking through Harlem and it was right on the, right on the corner of, uh, of the intersection of, of Malcolm X and, and Martin Luther King Boulevard. And... Young Mormons, these guys were like 17 and 18, but they were like eight Mormons deep in the middle of a crowd hmm. arguing with everyone. And I started, I was, I thought this was really interesting, right? <laughs> these, uh, wherever they came from, you got all these Mormons right, right there in the middle of Harlem arguing with everybody. But I started talking to one of them, was like, hey, what's, uh, what are you guys doing out here? And uh, he said, we're preparing to go to the Middle East to preach to Muslims and we decided we better we better get some very thick skin so we're going into places where we can argue a lot uh, to, to sort of toughen ourselves up because again they're just kids uh, to toughen ourselves up so that we can go to the Middle East and all I'm thinking is please make that a reality show Oh my goodness. I, anyone, would you watch Mormons evangelizing Muslims in the Middle East? I would watch that all day long. I'm just saying. Go to a place where they could argue a lot. Why didn't you just tell them to get married? That would have been good, right? That's how I learned my debating skills. 
That's why I lose all the debates at home. <clears throat> We've gone from the top of the cap or whatever that was to, all right, get shirts made. Here we go. Can you please explain what the Shriners are? I forgot. I don't remember what the Shriners are. They have a parade in Philadelphia. I don't know much about them. Do you, David? No. Great. What do you all look towards to further your knowledge? For me, it's Mike Winger videos, because I'm a wingling, <clears throat> unashamed wingling. If he lunges over the table, I'm, gonna, I'm getting out of the way. Okay? No, I, I also, I agree. It's just uh, I watch Mike Winger, and that gives me great knowledge of how and what not to do and how not to act ever. Yeah, I would just say I, I try to read. One thing I recommend is, so I read about 30 pages a day. If that's too much, read 10 pages a day of a book. If you do that in a year, that's 3,650 pages. How many books could you read just doing 10 minutes a day? in a year a lot so if you want to grow in knowledge do have a plan like that just in the morning in the evening when you're laying in bed just read 10 pages put a bookmark or a highlighter in it and then set it down to the next day continue from where you're at and you'll read a bunch of books yeah if you want to be a leader you got to be a reader and if you think about your own routine you have a lot of dead time where you're not doing anything like you know you're brushing your teeth or you're driving your car, or you're mowing the grass, or whatever you're, put a podcast in, put a book on, on audio on, listen to a, a YouTube video. I mean, use that time productively. Uh, what, one thing I've uh, been thinking about over the past several years is uh, that, uh, this, this is just me. Uh, some people have uh, like uh, really weird memories and stuff like that. I don't, I only remember the, st I, I tend to remember the stuff best if I just constantly use it over and over and over again. Uh, but I, I've noticed over the past several years that, I don't know, it seems like it may be better to know five or seven books really well than to read a hundred books and not remember them as well. So it's just been something that's like the, the books that I've read and studied repeatedly, I, I don't know, it seems like I get more out of that than just reading just reading tons of books in the past so anyway that's just, that's just a thought for anyone who doesn't have a weird dumb computer memory like mike here just a couple pieces of advice that i've applied in my own life as well is i had to kind of get past this mental block with audiobooks and with not finishing books because i would just i would get so down on myself like i started that book and i didn't finish it or i'm just listening on audio is that really reading just put all that aside because what's important is that you're learning and so once I kind of made it past that mental block, uh, there are some books I read physically, mostly on Kindle, but uh, I love to listen to audiobooks, and I, I learn well that way. And that's really okay, because sometimes I think we want the street cred of saying, oh, I read this book and that book. And also, if you don't finish a book, that's okay, too. If you got something out of it that you learned, then you learned something. And it's really okay if, you know, I've had books that had real strong starts, and I was like, wow, I'm really learning, learning. And then I'm, I find myself kind of slogging through, because maybe that material in the rest of the book isn't really applicable to what I need for my ministry. It's still really okay to shut it, put it down, and move on to something that's going to be really practical and helpful in the here and now. This is for Jones and Turek. That's the way it comes across here. Was the flood a global flood? Thank you. What, do you want to go first or do you want me to go first? All right. So, I mean, there are different views on this. I don't think the flood was necessarily global. I think it's described in hyperbolic language to speak as if it was, but it's using hyperbolic language. And one place I go is, is Genesis 8. It says the water was receding and the tops of the mountains were seen. So, what, mountains are starting to appear. Then it says that Noah released a dove. It says... The dove found no place to set her foot, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. Okay, if we're going to take that literally, then it has to contradict the prior verses of the tops of the mountains being seen. It seems like it's using hyperbolic language to talk about the extent of the flood. And Michael Heiser has written on this, and he says that he thinks, based on the table of nations and their extent, it would have been a regional flood in that area. So I tend to take that view. 
Uh, again, I don't think that's a, an issue to not break bread over. I don't think it's a salvation issue. I think you can believe in a global or a regional flood and be a Christian. I tend to just lean towards a regional one. A regional one that killed all humans except Noah's family, right? Well, I mean, we could say the same thing about the hyperbolic language. It kills the people in the whole area there. Right, but is that, is that, is that the view you take, the regional flood that where people were? Yeah. They, okay, 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 yeah. yeah I, I, I'm kind of agnostic on it, but that as long as the, the text, it, as it says, everybody was wiped out except Noah and his family, whether it's regional yeah. or not. Although it is interesting, you know, every major civilization has a great flood story. And, uh, and Mike does great videos on this, on inspiring philosophy, so you can go into detail with what he does. But, uh, you know, a lot of people try and say, oh, the Bible copied, really? Or is it possible that there really was a great flood everywhere? Yeah, maybe that's it. And people ask if there's a regional flood, why did Noah build a boat? Well, what the New Testament says, that Noah was a proclaimer of righteousness. God often asks prophets to do things to warn people of the coming sin. What is the best way for Noah to do? I'm building an ark. You can get on. There's something's going to come. And when it comes, I'll be out of here. But I'm going to stay here and warn you until that time comes. So I don't think that's a problem for the regional flood. Who was the Pharaoh who had to die before Moses could return to Egypt? Frank and I might fight. Let's do it. Come on. There we go. Yeah, I think the best evidence is different than Mike's position. I think the best evidence is the Exodus took place in 1446, and in 1406, that's when Jericho went down. Uh, and the Pharaoh was Amenhotep II of the Exodus. But Mike and I both agree this isn't essential. He might be right. It's not likely, but he might be right. Um, <laughs> But uh, the, there had to be a pharaoh prior to Amenhotep II that lived a long time for Moses to be at least 40 years. And as Mike's pointed out, that could be just a long, unknown period of time. And there was a pharaoh. I'm trying to think of his name at this point. you know who that name was? Uh, the pharaoh prior to Amenhotep II with Tutmosis III. Yeah, Tutmosis III. I think his reign was 54 years, if I'm not mistaken. Depends, yeah. I think roughly that, yeah. So that would mean that that fits. I don't know if it fits for Ramses II, does it? Well, the, the actual word in Exodus, I think it's three or four, is not the pharaoh who wanted you dead has died. It said all the men who wanted you dead or, or have passed away. So it's not saying it had to be a long reigning pharaoh. It says there were several men that wanted you dead and now they're all gone. So, you know, like Richard Hess, David Falk have said that could fit with many different time periods in Egypt for, if you're just looking at that line because of that. So it doesn't actually say that. It says all the men who wanted you dead. So I don't think there was a specific pharaoh necessarily. By the way, there are some good videos on Expedition Bible. That's Joel Kramer's YouTube channel. So you can see the 1446 Exodus uh, approach. And then if you want the 1200s approach, look at Mike's Inspiring Philosophy YouTube channel. But Joel Kramer has, is an archaeologist that actually lives in Jordan. He's lived most of his life in the Middle East. He was brought up in Saudi Arabia and studied in Jerusalem and now lives in Jordan. And his YouTube videos on archeology span are quite impressive. I had him on the show not long ago and he does this amazing one on modern day Babylon and ancient Babylon and how the Bible has it exactly right, how it'd be uninhabited. And it looks like he has drone footage. And I said to him, Joel, did you put a drone up in Iraq? He said, I can't talk about it. <laughs> I'll get into trouble. <laughs> Is theistic evolution a biblically viable option for Christians? Is this something Christians need to divide on? Mike, And they're ahead. really throwing us the hard ones here. Um, so I'll be honest, I am a theistic evolutionist. I don't believe in neo-Darwinian evolution, though. I held to a structuralist view of evolution, which is that the universe was fine-tuned to bring life to a certain point to bring about certain structures. So if you were to rewind the tape of life, start over, you would get human life again or something very similar because the universe is fine-tuned to bring about certain structures in biology. So I'm a structuralist. Uh, and I do think that is consistent with the biblical account. As a theistic evolutionist, I believe that there was a real historical Adam and Eve in a real garden, in a real place called Eden, with a real tree of life and a real tree of knowledge. There was a real fall. So I accept every core doctrine of Christianity. I don't think theistic evolution contradicts that. If you want to know more, you go to my channel, Inspiring Philosophy, in the playlist section, organized 
bunch of videos I did on Genesis 1 to 11. Just click on the Genesis 1 to 11 playlist and you'll get them all. Uh, yeah, you can be a Christian and be an evolutionist. I just don't think the evidence for evolution is there uh, for macroevolution, certainly for micro. And there, there was a telling uh, talk I went to back at in San Diego at ETS. When was that? Five years ago, maybe? They had theistic evolutionists in the room, high profile ones, and intelligent design people in the room. And several questions came from the audience about, okay, you're saying God intervene theistically in evolution. Where did he do it and when? And nobody would answer the question. If you don't have a where or a when, how do you know what happened? If you don't have a mechanism, how do you know what happened? So I, I just don't see the evidence. I see the evidence against it. Now, obviously Mike's right. If God intervene, he can do it and he can put information in and epigenetic information in whenever he wants to. I just don't see where, uh, and the theistic evolutionist won't tell us where this happens. Well, I mean, we, I, I would say in my particular view, it's not that God has to keep intervening. It's that God created these laws. And so Francis Collins says, God goes, it'll work out the way I need it to. He gets the laws perfect and then they just bring about life the way he wanted it to be. So that's the uh, view I think Collins or Conway Morris <clears throat> takes. Yeah, but Francis Collins' book, The Language of God, was obsolete the year after he published it because he talked about junk DNA and we've now discovered there's no such thing as junk DNA. Perfectly and Francis fine. Collins is the boss of Fauci and Francis Collins is the one that actually tried to stifle dissent over COVID, tried to, tried to actually discipline people, Epigeni, epidemiologists from Stanford. I mean, he may be a Christian, but I'm really disappointed in Francis Collins. Let me just say that. Fight, 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 fight. Sorry, no, All right, not, nothing against uh, Mike. Let's I'm just telling move right, you. Yeah, just move right along here. Um, <laughs> uh, that Francis thanks. Collins is almost as bad as Mike Winger. Uh oh. <laughs> I love Mike Winger. He's, he's joking. We all okay. love we Mike all Winger. We all love Mike Winger. He is joking, just so you guys know. I, I, I will love Mike Winger when he actually comes out to these events again. Mike, I know you're watching. Which camera is live? I know you're watching, Mike. You better get out. I've been telling you to come out. Wait, I don't know which one's live. Whatever. Uh, I can say I reluctantly love Mike Winger because uh, I'm commanded love your enemies. <laughs> Question is, is um, do we have an update on Braxton's health? He's been in my prayers. Um, Braxton is home from the, from the hospital. <clears throat> uh, and so, you know, doing better, but keep him in your prayers. That would be um, a good thing. Um, anybody want to take on dispensationalism versus covenant theology? I mean, I'm not a dispensationalist, but I'm trying to remember what covenant theology is. I can't remember the actual definition, so I don't want to misrepresent it. Chip, um, as I understand covenant theology, and I could be wrong, covenant theologians believe that if the parents are Christians, the children will ultimately be Christians. Am I right about that? I don't, I don't know that you could say that exactly, but I do believe they believe in covenant um, families. They do believe in baptizing. The False. Infants. So I don't, I don't believe in covenant theology. Are you a dispensationalist? Well, I believe there are certain dispensations, but if, if you're asking me my end times view, as I said yesterday, I'm not on the planning committee, I'm on the welcoming committee. So <laughs> there are people way smarter than me on eschatology that come to different views and they've studied it more than I have. So I'm agnostic on how it ends other than we win in the end. And I want to I want to watch you and Warren's Revelation series that you did here recently to learn more about that. Um, what future events does each panelist have coming up? Dinner? Go ahead. At Waffle House. What future events? Yeah, what future events does each panelist have coming up? What do you mean events like this or like stuff we're doing? Yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. I guess what you what are you doing next, or what what future events do you think are going to be unraveling? I don't know. I, I just dinner. David doesn't know what he's doing in fifteen minutes, let alone next week. That's true. That's true. Uh, yeah. A few years ago, I uh, announced a pretty cool plan, doing a series of uh, 
50 four to six minute videos, um, basically an entire apologetics course dealing with uh, Christianity and Islam. And I put it out there to the world uh, saying, hey, I want to put a video out with a full transcript each once, once per week and uh, looking for volunteers to translate the entire transcript, but then re-record it in your own language. So it's not like subtitles, it's actually people um, re-recording it uh, so that then they're, they have a full apologetics course uh, dealing with Islam in their own language uh, by, a, by a native speaker and so on. And people from around the world all agreed to do it, like dozens and dozens of, uh, of languages. Then I went out to record it and it didn't happen. Everything, everything went completely wrong. But uh, yeah, that's, that's finally coming together again. So uh, it's cool because that's one of the things I've been, you know, I've been wanting to work on for years. That and um, I don't know if anyone's noticed, but the new atheism is kind of imploding right now. Have you, have you noticed that? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm about to put out a bunch of stuff on that because uh, it, it's... Uh, if you go back 20 years and you look at uh, when the new atheist came out, the entire position was, man, if we could just get past this religion stuff, we can just get Christianity out of the way, we'll end up with this uh, scientific utopia and everything will be much better in the world. And the, anyone notice, like the moment people started headed in that direction, the entire world went completely insane? Well, you know, they put it forward like almost as a hypothesis, right? Like, hey, if we, we, we can go this way and this is what's going to happen. And it's all ended terribly disastrously. And, and uh, we kind of got to the point right now where you can start using that as, a, as an argument, right? Like, like, hey, if you guys were right, here's what we expect. Oh, it's the complete opposite. Guess what? It seems like you need Christianity more than... Uh, than you are aware of. And you can, you can actually even see this. I mean, if you see like, people like Ayan Hirsi Ali saying that she's a Christian. Now, if you listen to her beliefs, she doesn't sound like, any, like what uh, we would consider a Christian. But I've seen that when I post something like that, Awaken with JP, he was like a, a new age guru, but then he became a joke, but he was like serious. He was just doing like joke videos. But he was saying like, he, he put out a video saying that he, he's becoming more Christian as time goes by. And he says, it's not because I'm, I'm like, deciding to believe in Christianity, I'm just recoiling from evil so much that I just recognize I'm becoming more and more Christian. So again, that's not what we're thinking as Christian, but I think like lots of people, because when I post something like that, I see the comments and people are going, yeah, that's what's happening with me right now. This is what's happening with me. This is what's happening with me. Um, I, I think the world is kind of waking up. People were in a Christian world that had been massively influenced by Christianity so effectively that they think that's how human beings are and that's like our natural state and they do not realize what human beings are, are actually right and what Christianity has done for them. And I don't know, it looks like the entire world is uh, about to be waking up to the significance of, significance well, of Christianity. That doesn't make you Christian, but I think it's going to make people much more receptive and open because I, I saw this, I did a debate at Columbia University um, years ago, it was on, the, it was on uh, uh, the moral argument, and afterwards I ended up just hanging out with like, uh, I don't know, six or eight of the atheists, there were no one else there, just, just me and a bunch of atheists, they were all Asian atheist students, and we were hanging out afterwards and they were asking me questions about, you know, why I believe in God and things like that, and I gave an argument and I said to someone, to the one on the end, I said, uh, the atheist on the end, I said, hey, uh, what, what do you think about that? And he said, to be honest, I don't really care that it's true. I just care that it's bad. And that was surprising to me. Like, I mean, I don't believe that Islam is true. If it were, it would really matter to me if Islam were true, even though I think it's bad. I would want to know that it's true. So it was like surprising to me to hear, I don't care if it's true. I just care that it's bad. Now, so I went to the atheist beside him. It was a girl. And I said, do you agree with that? She said, yes. I went down the line and every last one of them agreed with that statement. I do not care that this is I don't care if it's true or not. I care that it's bad. And so you had basically a generation that were programmed not to think in terms of the evidence, but to think in terms of religion is bad for the world and they would act like they're interacting with the evidence, but they've ar they had already decided it's bad. And so they're interpreting the arguments and evidence through their lens that this is just horrible for the world. And so if we kind of 
get beyond that, hey guys, you didn't know what you were talking about and uh, you fell for a bunch of complete nonsense and you guys who said, ah, we're gonna have this uh, you know, scientific utopia and then it falls apart and makes things worse. I don't know, I think, we're, uh, I think we're in for some exciting times. So anyway, I've got a ton of stuff coming out on that. On that note, uh, I have a video coming out in April titled How Christianity Changed the World. Fell into a rabbit hole of numerous studies that like most people have not heard of on missionary activity in places like India, China, Africa, South America, just showing that where Christian missionaries showed up, higher rates of illiteracy, female education, male education, more hygiene habits, better health care, more economic prosperity, democracy, freedom. And these are not just people voicing their opinions. These were actual studies performed. So they're running things like OLS models. And they're demonstrating that where Christian missionary activity went, it led to all these amazing results. And so Christianity has changed the world in its desire to make the world, to allow the world to read the Bible. They ended up building hospitals, churches, uh, you know, all sorts of things like, you know, schools, libraries. They use printing presses to get information out. So that video is coming out in April. Other than that, I am going to be continuing my series on the reliability of the Gospels. I have a video coming out Friday arguing the synoptics date before 70 AD. I'll be doing a video this summer arguing for Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. Uh, and I'll also be working with a couple of scholars on a study they have coming out, a scientific analysis, arguing for the reliability of the Gospels using names. So that's something coming up on my channel right now. Uh, well, I've got several speaking events coming up. Uh, Frank and I will actually be in Detroit on Saturday for our Unshaken Conference with our friend Natasha Crane, so be praying for us for that. I'll be in Fort Lauderdale next week at Coral Ridge for the Kingdom Come Conference. I don't know, how far is that from here, Fort Lauderdale? Three and a half. Okay, so the diehards, you can drive out and Wait, see that. Rob Podsienza. Pardon me? Rob Podsienza. That's right, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, yeah, so just quite a few. I'm going to be at Impact 360 next week, which is a wonderful ministry that has a gap year program for students that have graduated high school where they train them in theology, apologetics, community, discipleship. It's just wonderful. So I'm going to be three days there training the fellows about deconstruction and progressive Christianity. There are 643 million Christians below the Sahara Desert in Africa. Where is Xander? Xander, are you here? He came all the way from South Africa. I don't know if he's still here. Where is Xandor the Relentless? Oh, there he is right there. Okay, he came all the way from South Africa to be here. And uh, there are 643 million folks like him. Some of them are in a life and death struggle with Islam, particularly toward Nigeria in that area. So we decided as a ministry we needed to get uh, our material into the, the top seven languages in Africa, which will reach about half of the 1.4 billion people that live there. And so we, we're right now developing a proprietary AI program. We're using AI for good to translate our best videos and the videos of other apologists too. So I want some stuff from David Wood that we can translate. That's all copyrighted. Uh, we're, that's what, Mike Winger told me I could use it. Um, <laughs> So uh, we're going we're gonna to try and put the best stuff that we can out there, not just from our ministry, but from other ministries. And uh, so pray for us because we have to raise a lot more money to do this. Because not only when you create this AI program, you need people on the ground to check it out because it's not perfect. But it saves so much time if you have an AI program to translate stuff. We can make people actually look like they're saying something when they're not with AI. So we could, I could speak uh, Swahili, look like I'm speaking Swahili even though I'm really not. So we're going to either do that or we're going to create subtitles for uh, our top videos and blogs and that of other apologists too. So that's really what we're working on. In addition to going to universities, uh, next week I'll be at a university in Louisiana. The week after that we're going to be in uh, Boise State. Uh, we're gonna, we might go to NYU. I should bring you to NYU on April 11th. We're looking at that opportunity. We're going to be on the quad at NYU at Washington Park there. And uh, that's our goal anyway. We don't know if that date's going to work, but that's what we do. We go to college campuses and try and show people Christianity is true and take a lot of questions. Uh, I, I just wanted to encourage everyone, the, the project he was talking about uh, dealing with Africa, uh, massively important, anyone who wants to. Uh, help out with that. That's for, first I've uh, heard about it, but I, I have noticed lots of Christians around the world. Uh, I don't know, it's just built into us that like the what, what happens in the West is what matters. 
And if you look at how things actually work with like the Muslim world, you know, there's a, there's a, there are lines in certain areas where it's Muslim majority on one side and Christian majority on the other side, or like in India, Muslim majority on one side and Hindu majority on the other side, like of that line. And those are, I mean, to me, those are like some of the most important spots on the planet because the goal in Islam is to keep pushing that line year after year after year. So if you look at like the worst persecution in the world right now, Nigeria, and why? Because you have mostly Muslims in the north and mostly Christians in the south, and they're trying to push their way, the jihadis, Boko, jihadi groups, Boko Haram and so on, they're trying to push their way south until they have completely done that. And what, guess what? They're not stopping there. They're gonna keep going down and down and down. And uh, so those, that, those are actually some of the most important places in the world to, uh, to, to equip Christians to, uh, to respond to some of these issues so that they can inform people um, about what's going on. So yeah, cr people need to take a stand. By the way, we're, we're just starting in Africa. The next uh, spot is the Middle East. So by the end of the year, we hope to be in the Middle East. We're creating websites in all of these different languages and then YouTube channels and all that. So that's what we're trying to do. If you go to our YouTube channel, look for the we're ready to launch video. It's called Kingdom AI, because it's not just our ministry. We're just financing it, but we want to get other ministries involved too, because these guys and gals do stuff that I don't do, but all everything they do, the people over there need. That's great. Um, I'm preaching this weekend. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> um, anyway, it is, uh, it's past time. Uh, I, I, I think that we've had a wonderful time. I know that I'll, I'll hang out here for a little bit too. If you have any questions, I'm sure everybody else will. Um, I, I just wanna say to everybody, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for um, taking your time to be here. Um, I do hope this was uh, something that was worthwhile, um, but I would like to thank the panelists for their time and their involvement and what they do. And uh, we will uh, we'll close out with a word of prayer. Father, we are grateful for who you are and what you've done in our lives. Thank you for the salvation that you have given us in your son, Christ Jesus. We're grateful for that. Lord, I thank you for the panelists that are here, what they're doing, <clears throat> the untold amount of people that they have um, really spoken into, probably the untold amount of people that have come to faith because of their respective ministries. Um, I do pray that you'd bless all four of them pray that you would lead them and guide them and direct them in all that they do. And I pray, Lord, that you would give them your hand of providence and that you would give them great prosperity, Lord, in sharing the gospel message and um, opening up eyes to hear and ears to hear, Lord, so that people can come to know Jesus. I thank you for everyone that's here that came. Um, Lord, I know some people have to travel a long way back to go home. I pray that you would give everybody traveling mercy. Um, I pray that you would continue to lead God and direct all of us and equip us, Lord, to, uh, to be the people that you've called us to be. And Lord, for those of us in here that do go to Grace Community Church, um, being here for the Apologetics Conference doesn't give you an exemption from church this weekend, so have them be here. And Lord, we thank you for everything in Christ's name and all of God's people said, amen. God bless everybody. Thank you so much for coming and uh, safe travels to everyone.